If you don't know me, my name is Nate. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, Pastor Andy is away celebrating his anniversary with his lovely wife. Uh, So we celebrate that. Uh, But he'll be back with us next week and he'll continue with the same series that we are in the midst of today entitled Broken. This, This whole series has really been an examination of how God can use broken things for his glory. How God can take something that others may have given up on how he can redeem it how he can put it back together how he can make it better than it even was before and how he can take that broken thing that broken situation and he can use it and turn it into a story that changes lives that's what this church is full of just brokenness but brokenness that God took shaped and turned into something that is now a story that impacts others Today we're going to go to Mark chapter 14. If you have a Bible with you, go ahead and turn in there, or maybe you have it on your phone or a tablet, go ahead and get to Mark chapter 14, and we're going to start in verse 3. Mark chapter 14, verse 3. If you don't have a Bible with you, no problem, it's going to be right here on the screen. We're going to read through this together. While he was eating, meaning Jesus, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard she broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head some of those at the table were indignant why waste such expensive perfume they asked it could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor so they scolded her harshly but Jesus replied Leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? He says, you will always have the poor among you, and you can help them whenever you want, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. And then he says this, I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. Today, um, I want to speak out of something God is doing in me and in my heart as we dig into this passage. That's always what we as preachers want to do. A lot of times we speak because we know there's a certain need or something going on in the life of the church or something going on in the world that we need to speak to. But sometimes we just go and we share what God's doing in us. And it becomes a message, and the hope is just that what's happening in us impacts someone else. Before we really get into this, uh, Pastor Greg mentioned a few weeks ago, uh, Pastor Andy, our pastor, also mentioned this. Brokenness is not necessarily a bad thing. We, We need to get our minds around that. A lot of times we hear about brokenness, we think of brokenness, and it's something we struggle with and it's just oh it's bad and there's something wrong with me and I, brokenness doesn't have to be a bad thing especially when we know the one who can put it all back together the, the circumstances that we face the situations that we go through the heartache that we experience it doesn't have to end there because God can take it and use it right so it doesn't have to be a bad thing but There's something really unique and powerful about this passage that we read today, um, a different kind of brokenness, if you will. Because I believe as we read this, we see a brokenness that really attracts the attention of the Father in a powerful way, something that really uh, we need to dig into. And it's one, it's a brokenness that's not necessarily thrust upon us. It's not circumstantial. Because we are, we're all gonna go through relational wounds. Someone hurt us, someone walked away that we thought would never give up on us, right? But we all go through loss, we all go through suffering. But what we see here today is something unique. And I want you to take note of this. Look in verse three. It says, while Jesus was eating, this woman came in with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume. And it says this, she broke open the jar and poured out the perfume over his head. Who broke it? She broke it. No one asked her to. No one told her to. It wasn't a brokenness that was forced onto her. She broke it. She 
chose it. Her brokenness was not a condition uh, of some traumatic event that had happened to her or some wound. Her brokenness was not about how she felt. It was a response to who he was. See, there's something really cool going on in this passage because this brokenness that this woman experienced is one that draws us closer to Jesus. It's one that, that catches his heart. It's one that shows us more of his character because this is a brokenness of our choosing. It's not one that we have to go through because something bad happened around us. It's not one that we experience. It's one that we embrace. It's one that we say, I'm going to be broken so that I can see what God has in store. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about a brokenness of our choosing, something that we have to come to Jesus and say, whatever you want to do, do it. I'm here and I'm choosing to be broken. I'm here and I'm saying, I'm going to take this. But we need to understand a few things because this doesn't come easy. See, a brokenness of our choosing, you need to understand first of all that a brokenness of our choosing will always be costly. Okay? Here's the thing. That's churchy and you're like, yes, that's, yep, mm mm-hmm, nod, nod. Uh, we want cheap religion. That's what we want. I, I'm being nice about it. I can be ugly if you want me to. Do y'all like the ugly Nate or the nice Nate? You just tell me. How about a mixture of both? Okay. We want cheap religion. We want the blessings of God. We want a relationship with God. We want things to go right in our world. We want things to be comfortable and easy. And, and we want it to come at no cost to us. Well, I said yes to Jesus when I was a seven-year-old boy, and he's just, I just, thank you, Jesus. We, we want something that comes easily. We want something that doesn't take a great investment. It's just, it's human nature. But the reality is, if we want a brokenness that really shows us the heart of Jesus, we're gonna have to understand it will cost us dearly. You say, Nate, that kind of freaks me out a little bit. It shouldn't. Because the reward is far greater than choosing just to stay where we are. See, it was not uncommon in this culture for this kind of anointing to occur. A lot of times we read this story and we're like, oh, wow, that's crazy. This woman anointed him and that's kind of weird. And no, no, no. This was commonplace. This is what happened in this culture. When you had a guest come into your home as an act of honor and as cleaning, you would actually anoint their hands, sometimes their feet. You would anoint them with oil. It was just a way to show respect, a way to show honor. So this wasn't peculiar. It wasn't weird at all. But what she used was. See, look at verse 3. It says, she came in with what? A beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume. A beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume. Okay? Now, this oil that we're talking about, this perfume that we're talking about, as we already read in verse 5, it, it was worth a lot of money. It, it, we actually read that it was worth, one of them says, hey, we could have sold this for a year's wages. That's exactly right. In this day and age, there was something called a denarii, and it was one denarii was a day laborer's typical wage. Now, I want you to imagine this, because we hear that and we're like, wow, it was expensive. Imagine for me, how many of you have a job that you get a paycheck every week, every two weeks, every month, right? Imagine taking the totality of that over one year and going to buy perfume at Belk. I'm not, no, 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 I'm not talking about after you pay for your house, after you pay for your car, after you pay for, I'm talking take the totality of that amount and then you go to Belk, I'm like, can I get the most expensive perfume you have? And you buy that. We're gonna talk because you have problems. That's what we say, but that's exactly what happened here. 
worth a year's wages. This oil, this essence of nard was something that was likely imported from India. It wasn't easily attained. It's not something she could just go down to a corner market and say, can I get some of that? Had to be brought in. And it wasn't just the oil. The jar itself was made out of something called alabaster, equally valuable in its own right. The oriental alabaster that we talk about in scripture, it actually comes from these limestone caves. It's a mineral deposit that builds up from the dripping of the water that creates these stalagmites, okay? And what they would do is they would go into these Egyptian caves and they would cut big chunks out of this alabaster, this this mineral deposit. They would take the whole chunk They would pull it out and then they would actually come to a place where the the jar was hewn directly out of that chunk. They carved it out by hand to create this. A lot of times it would look something like this. This was a larger vessel that someone royalty probably would have had. Beautiful. Expensive. Not easy to get a hold of. Costly. So you had this expensive oil, you had this expensive jar, and what's unique about these jars, they were perfect for storing these kinds of perfumes and ointments because they didn't allow air inside. They weren't porous in any way, so you didn't have to worry about evaporation, but to make sure of that, they actually had to seal the jar off permanently on the top. So in order to get what was inside, you had to break the container. Did y'all, nowadays they have them, my kids have these and they're, uh, it just takes all the fun out of it, I think. But my kids have these piggy banks now that you flip over and it's got the big plug on the back. Y'all know what I'm talking about? So they save it up and they can dump it all out. How many of you are old school in here and know how a piggy bank really works? Right? You didn't have a little hole. You didn't get to pull that plug. The old school piggy banks, when you had those, you better know that you know that you know you're ready to break that thing. That's exactly what was going on here. And this is what I want you to catch from this, okay? Expensive alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Listen to me. Sometimes in our lives, we need to recognize that we have to break something of great worth in order to reveal what is of greater worth on the inside. Sometimes we have to lay something down that's valuable to us in order to see what's of greater value on the other side. Let me make it just real practical, okay? I think that many of us in this room, what we are struggling with is we are holding on to some things with a far greater intensity than that intensity with which we hold to Christ. We are holding, we are clinging to some things a whole lot harder than we cling to Jesus. Some of us, it's our kids. We're, we're clean to those kids. We're holding on to them. Some of us, it's, it's our job. It's, it's our finances. It's money. For some, it's comfort. For some, it's security. And we hold on to that. And listen, I truly believe that we are actually hindering our relationship with Jesus Christ because we are so obsessed with clinging to something that we see as valuable, not realizing if we'll just come to him and break it open, he'll show us something of greater value. He'll show us what he can do in and through us if we'll just lay down all of the stuff that we're holding on to. That kind of brokenness, that choosing that we have to make will change us. I see it wasn't just costly in the sense that it cost a lot of money. It's quite possible. It is believed by some scholars that perhaps this jar, and in her case, it was probably about a 12-ounce jar that was sealed at the top. It's believed that perhaps it was an heirloom that was passed on from her mother. Some believe it was set aside just for a special occasion, maybe a specific special occasion. How many ladies in here, uh, how many younger ladies, maybe you aren't married yet, still do what's called a hope chest? My wife had one of those. For, for the ladies who are married, how many of you had a hope chest before you got married? Some of you. It's kind of a passing thing. People don't do it a whole lot anymore. But a hope chest 
Uh, the one that my wife had was just this big, huge wooden box, and on the inside, it had all of her dreams and wishes for her fairy tale wedding. That's what it, that's what it was. You would, st- you would also store things for when you started a family and had a house, maybe dishes or silverware. But in this box, I remember Michelle had all of this stuff inside. She had our wedding planned before we were together. It was like, it was set. It was ready to go. I just walked in. I'm like, okay. And everything was great. So she had this hope chest and every bit of that was a plan. It was something she was saving. It was something she had in preparation for the day that she would meet me. There are scholars who believe that this jar of oil that this woman had was essentially the same thing. That she was saving it for that special occasion of her wedding night where on her wedding night she would choose to break it open and pour it out on her husband, the man that she was saying, I'm going to commit the rest of my life to you. Are you catching how costly this investment was? Because you see, here in this moment, I think that this woman knew, I'm not going to find a greater occasion than this. And no insult to what may have been her future husband, I I, I think if that's really what she was saving it for, she was probably thinking, I'm never going to find a man like this. Listen, I know your husband is great, but he's not Jesus. Trust me. I think that's where she was. She was willing to make this sacrifice if for nothing else than just to say, there's never going to be a moment like this. It was a brokenness of her choosing, and it was costly. But secondly, a brokenness of our choosing will always bring questions and criticism always every single time that we come to a place where we say Jesus I just want to know you more I just want to know you uh, more intimately more deeply I I just want to understand a little bit more about what it is that you're doing in my life there will be people who raise their eyebrows I don't know about that look at this look at the first question that was asked some of those at the table who was at the table religious leaders, disciples gathered around for a meal some of those at the table were indignant they were furious, they were ticked off they were frustrated and they said why? why Why are you doing all this lady? what's wrong with you? Why, why waste such expensive perfume? why do this when we could sell it for a year's wages? why would you make a choice like this? I remember as a teenage kid, I had figured out what I wanted to do with my life. I loved acting. I loved music. And I wanted to do that with my life, some way, shape, or form. I I enjoyed having the opportunity to bring a smile to people's faces through acting, for them to sing along and enjoy as I sang, I remember my plan, I had it laid out. And then I can distinctly remember like it was yesterday, the day that I felt God going, mm, I got a different plan. I, I want you to pour your life into ministry. I, that's what I want you to do from here on out. Now, l- let me be clear on something because I think a lot of times, especially for young people that are in the room, okay? A lot of times we hear a story like that and we're like, oh, great, that's awesome. There's perfect evidence. God ruined your life. Um, <laughs> no, listen, see, here's the thing. I think when God calls us to something like that, what he does is in that moment, the desires of his heart become the desires of our heart. And we don't look at it going, well, I guess I'll go into ministry. We're like, yes, I'm gonna do this. I'm excited. That's what happens when God does something like that. So naturally, I was excited. I was looking forward to it. So I told everybody I could. Now, there were a few people that were like, I knew it. I'm like, okay, so you're a prophet. Good for you. And there were other people that were like, oh, well, okay, that sounds interesting. But I remember one teacher who had watched me, who had watched me develop into a young actor, a young musician, and I remember this teacher saying, hey, come, come sit down. I want to talk to you a minute. I'm like, yeah, sure. She's like, so I heard about 
this decision you've made? And I said, well, yeah, it's kind of a decision. It's more like, you know, God saying, hey, you're going to do this. Um, she was like, okay, okay. And she looked at me straight in the eyes, sitting across her desk, and she said, you're throwing your life away. Now, hold on. Whoa, hold on. Don't throw her under the bus. Because some of you are like, oh, that witch. No, calm down. Calm down. Because what you're doing is you're taking a position that fits for church on Sunday morning. Because here's the funny part. In this story, it wasn't a teacher who didn't know Christ that was sitting at the table. It was the people who had spent the past three years with him. You see, many times when God calls you to a brokenness that's this deep and this intense, many times you will find that the people who ask the questions are not the ones out there. They're the ones sitting right next to you in church on Sunday. They're the ones looking at you going, when all of a sudden your worship becomes a display of your brokenness, hands lifted to the sky, tears streaming down your face, and you're doing the Oprah cry. And you look around and you'll notice there's some people going, does it really take all that? Put your hands down now. They haven't told us to put our hands up in the song yet. Put them down. (laughs) Those are going to be the people that ask the questions. And every one of us in this room, including myself, are guilty of it. So I want to put us all on an even playing field here. We've all looked at someone before who's saying they're making a decision to break themselves and pour themselves out for Christ and we've gone, you're crazy. Every one of us have done it. And my hope is that if you haven't already, every one of us are on the other side of that where we make a decision to break ourselves and pour ourselves out for Christ and have somebody say, you're crazy. It's the question people ask when you, you're offered a promotion and instead you say, no, you know, because I need my Wednesday nights open so I can go hang out with the teenagers. You're crazy. It's the question our students get when 20 of them pack their bags and give up part of their summer to say, we're going to fly to the Dominican Republic to pour our lives out. What is wrong with you? We could be having a good summer. There will always be questions. There will always be criticism. They will always ask that one question, why? And all I can give you is this. Hear me. Those who ask why will never understand what they're unwilling to experience. How many of you, do we have any bird watchers in the room? Anybody watch birds? Yeah, a few of you. That's cool. I don't do it because we don't have trees in our neighborhood. So, but... They're fascinating creatures. And there's, there's two ways that you can study a bird. Two ways that you can understand a bird. One is you can study a bird the way a biologist studies it. Okay? The catch is you have to start with a dead bird. Take the bird, pin it down, and you get a scalpel and you cut the bird open. And you look inside and you say, there's the bird's lungs and there's the bird's stomach and there's the bird's heart. And there's the, I don't know what that is. But you, you lay it down, you pick it apart, you analyze it. That's one way to study the bird. Or you can study the bird the way an ornithologist studies it. What an ornithologist does is he goes to where the bird lives he goes to where the bird goes. He watches how the bird operates in its environment. He watches how the bird interacts with its environment and those within that environment. He studies and he does so by being where the bird is. Some of you are like, what? We've got too many religious people that are trying to pin Jesus down and understand him by picking him apart when what you need to do is go to where he is. We need more people in the church that stop saying, I want to understand, and first say, God, just show me what you're going to do. Show me where you are and let me get in on it. I just want to be a part of it. Whatever it is you're doing, I'll go where you go. I'll watch how you work. I'll see how you interact in your environment because we all know that his environment is the earth and the fullness thereof. That's what it means to break ourselves. And Jesus' response to this was, she has done what she could. 
She has done what she could. Stop worrying about the things you're not good at and the things you can't do. Stop worrying about how you can't do it like somebody else. Choose your brokenness. Okay? I think that's what Jesus was saying here. Listen, she's done what she could. And it's a good thing. I also think he was saying, hey, she's done what she could. I think there was a little bit of a neck snap to that. She's done what she could. What are you doing? See, many times we're so busy saying, what are they doing that we don't realize God's going, no, 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 what are you doing? My child, what are you doing? There will always be questions. There will always be criticism. And then I'm gonna wrap up with this. When we choose this kind of brokenness, a brokenness of our choosing will have lasting impact. I love this. I love this because I don't know that this woman knew the power of what she had done. But we know. I I don't know that she processed other than I can't miss this moment. You're gonna have times in your life where God opens a door, God opens an opportunity for you to bless someone. For, for, for you to bless him through your worship, through your giving, through a life surrendered saying, I'll do whatever it is that you want me to do. I don't know that she necessarily understood the impact of this, but when we choose this brokenness, it will impact lives beyond what we could imagine. My father um, is a uh, cologne lover. Uh, he he uh, operates by the motto, 40 squirts never hurts. Um, and he smells good. I mean, like, you know, y'all know, the ladies will admit to this, guys, don't, we don't really, but ladies, if you ever walk by a guy, you're like, man, he smells good. That's, that's my dad. Uh, it's, it's funny, though, because it's so distinct, and we, we know where Papa has been. We went on vacation not long ago, and I remember we were walking through the hotel. I can tell you within about 250 feet, if my, my dad is nearby. We were walking through our hotel and one of my youngest says, Papa's somewhere, I smell him. <laughs> it's awesome. But I remember when my two youngest were little, uh, my mother-in-law and my dad would help take care of them when Michelle and I had to go to work. And I remember coming home every single time I would pick up Karis or I would pick up Canaan And first I would smell their little baby heads because if you miss that, you're just missing life. But then I would hold them close and you could smell Papa. He was gone. He left, but I could still smell where he had been. There was still an impact there. I knew he had been nearby, right? Now, all kidding aside, he doesn't actually use 40 squirts of cologne. It's just a few. But, Think about this with me. A couple of squirts and I know where my dad is that far off. I could smell it on my kids when he was long gone. This woman had opened a jar, broke open a jar that contained 12 ounces of perfume. And this was not like our perfume. It was not a product that was mostly water. It was a product that's base was oil. And it was filled with this scent. And if any of you, especially again, uh, those of you in the room, the ladies, you've smelled those essential oils that are so popular right now. Imagine 12 ounces poured out. It saturated his hair, his beard, his skin, his clothes, the robe that he wore everywhere that he went. It saturated every part of him. And stick with me here. I know this is, this is a little bit creative on this element, but, but I need you to catch this, okay? Because I can't help but imagine verse one of chapter 14 says that this took place two days before Passover. That's how close we are to his crucifixion. Now, don't you think that that night as he walked into a room to share one last meal with his disciples and as he bent down to wash their feet that they could actually smell the aroma of this woman's brokenness on him. Don't you think that as Jesus stood in that garden 
and one of his own disciples walked up to him and leaned in for a kiss to betray him. Don't you think that Judas was impacted by the brokenness of this woman? That as Jesus stood before Pilate and he asked the question, are you the Christ? That he could smell. He was impacted by that. As they were gathered in a room, in a basement room, where those who were part of the religious order would gather and try him, don't you think that as they mocked him and questioned him, something in the room triggered them all to go, what's that smell? As soldiers took their whips and beat him with every single lash of the whip, don't you think that they caught the aroma of this woman's brokenness? As they gambled over a road that wasn't theirs, soldiers cast lots at the foot of a cross, and you have to believe that they could smell the aroma of that woman's brokenness on that road they were gambling for. This kind of brokenness has impact that you will never know. You choose one time to say, God, everything you want from me, everything that I am, I want to be broken. You make that decision once and watch how God changes countless lives as a result of that one decision. And here we are some 2,000 years later, just like Jesus said, they'll talk about her. They'll talk about her. That is powerful. And you say, Nate, but it's perfume. And I don't, no, 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 listen. Here's the thing. This isn't about perfume. And I love how God ties these stories in Scripture back to our lives. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. You may not have a vessel of oil, but listen. We have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. You have something in you. You are that earthen vessel. You have something in you of incalculable worth if you call yourself a Christ follower. And it is the life, it is the hope, it is the joy, it is the transformation that you yourself have experienced. And at some point, you're gonna have to choose brokenness. You're gonna have to choose to lay everything else down. All your comfort, all your security, everything that you know so that you can say, break me and change people as a result of this one moment. Every head bowed, every eye closed.